So uh, we want to give a loud shout for him as he comes up and, and get, has another word for us. So. Good morning, everybody. It's good to be back with you. I'm glad you've come back for a second time. And uh, today we're going to be pursuing the subjects that we're looking at yesterday, but looking at in a bit more detail. One thing I omitted yesterday was to actually tell you who Satan was. Uh, you remember he was on the platform, at least Matt Moore was on the platform, uh, taking the part of Satan, a little drama. Matt, will you just stand up a second? Matt is the USA... National Director for LL Ministries, and some of you may get to know him a bit more if you ever come to the LL Center in Florida. Anyway, Matt is the director there. Outside, we have a number of books that have come through the work of LL Ministries, and we're doing a couple of special offers for you for today. Uh, the book that's used here and has been used for teaching, which I wrote a number of years ago, called Healing Through Deliverance, it's a great big tome, uh, but it's got an awful lot in it, and its normal price is $35, but for the students here, at this, if you buy them here, it's $25, so uh, that's available today outside at $25, and a book which I'll be talking a bit about tomorrow on healing from accident, shock, and trauma that's only just come out, and that's 17, but it's 12 for you here, and 10% off all the other books. There's quite a lot of resources. Uh, we, we want you to be able to buy them as cheaply as possible. Yesterday, we did some foundational work in putting in place some theological understanding of the healing and deliverance ministry. We understand in our little drama that when Satan was thrown out of heaven, he lost his authority, but he still had power. We saw that when God created mankind, he made us in God's image and likeness. We are three in one, just as God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We are spirit, we are soul, and we are body. And that when God put man on the earth, he gave power through relationship and he gave authority over the earth. Now, Satan had power but no authority, and what happened in the fall was that man chose to obey Satan. And in choosing to obey Satan, he put his authority that he had over the earth under Satan's control. So Satan got authority back, and he became the god of this world. And we saw how power and authority are very important principles for us to understand. And we'll see a bit more of that in the ministry of Jesus. We saw how the healing message goes through from Genesis 3.15, when God said, one day out of the woman will come one who will crush the head of the serpent, and that means have a higher authority than Satan will be able to deal with him. And so when Jesus came, deliverance ministry was part of his mandate because he had authority to deal with the powers of darkness. We understood that Jesus was without sin, and therefore, if Satan's here, Jesus is here. Man who has sinned is here, but Jesus came, and he never sinned, so he had authority over the powers of darkness. And we who are sinners, who believe in Jesus, are in Christ. So we come into that position of authority with him, to be able to deal with the works of darkness in deliverance ministry. We are in Christ, and Christ is in us. You've got that twofold, that we're in him, and he is in us. And then we came right to the end of our teaching yesterday, and we saw how John the Baptist brought a message saying, prepare the way of the Lord, make the way straight for him. And he and his disciples were preaching a doctrine, teaching of repentance. And they talked about the fact that the kingdom of heaven is coming and saying, repent. And that means turn round, change direction. And it's not just repent in the head. It means repent with the heart. 
And it's so easy to say, oh, yes, I repent. But in your heart, you're still thinking, I'll do it again. We need to be in a place where repentance is not just a head issue. It's a heart issue also. (laughs) Then there's a little problem took place by the River Jordan. Jesus was in the line waiting to be baptized. Now, this gave John the Baptist a real problem because Jesus was without sin. And John the Baptist had already said, look, he's the Lamb of God who will take away the sin of the world. And that's a messianic statement. He is the perfect Lamb. You couldn't get rid of any old scraggy old Lamb in the sacrificial system. It had to be a perfect Lamb. And Jesus was the perfect Lamb of God without sin. And here he is in the line waiting to be baptized. And John says, I can't baptize you. You baptize me. And the two of them have a bit of an argument on the banks of the River Jordan as to who's going to do it. And Jesus then said, it's necessary to fulfill my Father's will. And Jesus submitted to a baptism of repentance. Now, he's never sinned. So why is he repenting? But on the cross, he was going to die for your sins and mine. So he came in an association with your sin and mine in an act going into that baptism of repentance and he was pleasing the Father. And at that moment, Jesus entered into the commission that his Father had given him. And the moment he associated himself with your sin and with mine, the heavens opened and the Spirit of God came down. And everybody saw the reality that this is my beloved Son, as the Father was saying. They saw the dove descending. This was the moment at which Jesus began to fulfill his ministry commission. You know, sometimes people ask me, well, how can I get more anointed? How can I get more of the Holy Spirit? And my answer is always, get more obedient to what God has asked you to do. Because at that moment, the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus in that act of supreme obedience. And At that moment, Jesus' ministry began. And how did it begin? He was driven into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Oh, Lord, no, not that. You might think that when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, it's the glory train from then on. You know, but at that moment, God wants you to be tested. He wants to know that you're going to follow him and obey him. And he allows the enemy to test us. And there are three major temptations that Jesus received. I'm not going to go into them all because of time, but one of them I want to just draw attention to because it's highly relevant to this subject of deliverance. The devil led Jesus to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to Jesus, I will give you all their authority. Oh, that word again. Satan saying to Jesus, I will give you all their authority and splendor for it's been given to me. Now who gave it to Satan? Mankind did. Man gave that authority to Satan. And Satan said, yes, it's been given to me. So if it's been given to me, I can give it away. And so Jesus, forget about the cross. Forget about all the things that you thought were a good idea to do to redeem mankind. I can give you an easier way. He says, bow down and worship me. And if you worship me, you can have the lot. You can have the authority which was given to me. You see, at that moment, Jesus did not disagree with Satan's analysis. He didn't disagree with the fact that authority had been given into Satan's hands. He had power from his creation, and he had authority back on planet Earth. And Jesus said, no, I'm not going to come under your authority. It's written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Now, worship is a key understanding in order for us to actually grasp how it's possible for people to be demonized, to have a spirit come into them. Have you ever noticed that when you truly are in spirit, soul, and body, actively worshipping the Lord, that you sense the Holy Spirit. When we're worshipping, 
The Spirit of God is welcomed. Now, worship is not just when you're singing a song. The Hebraic understanding of worship is that every act of life is an expression of worship. Just take a deep breath now. And praise God for the air that you breathe. It's a miracle that that air is there. That miracle, if I had time to go into all the gravity, it's an absolute miracle. I was trained as a chemist. Absolute miracle that this five miles of air is still there, held in place by gravity that stops it spinning off into outer space, but so finely balanced that if gravity changed by not point, not, 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 one percent, you couldn't breathe that air. If gravity went down, the air would fly off into space. Gravity went up, you'd be crawling on your hands and knees to snip it off the ground. It's a miracle of what God has put into created order. See, worship... I thank God I can look at a leaf, I can look at the sky, I can look at whatever he's made, a flower, and say, God, you're clever. One of my favorite phrases when I'm walking in the country is, God, how do you do that? God, you're clever. And this is the whole Hebraic understanding. We see everything, if you read Psalm 19, it's all about worship and, and gravity. Uh, I haven't got time to look into that, but you can follow it up. Psalm 19 is all about the wonders of gravity. Doesn't say use the word gravity, but you can read it there. We worship God for who He is. And when we worship Him, and when we obey Him, God indwells us with His Spirit. If you love me, Jesus said, you will obey me. You, see, you can't separate worship and obedience. And when we worship Him, we love Him, we're created to enjoy Him. And then we walk in his ways, God pours his spirit upon us. And so that when people choose to walk in the things that God has prepared them for, he empowers them by his spirit to do them. You read through the history of missions down the centuries, and you see people have heard the voice of God. They've walked forward in obedience, and God has empowered and provided for them in extraordinary ways. And as we walk in obedience, God pours his spirit in. Now, just take this principle. If you're walking in obedience to God, you're endued with his spirit, ask yourself a question. If we are made to worship God, and when we worship, we receive spirit, what happens when we obey Satan instead of God? Ah, there's a principle here. God has made us a spirit, soul, and body, and he's made us to receive his indwelling spirit. When we walk with him, we worship him, and we obey him. And Satan says to Jesus, bow down and worship me, and you can have all my authority. Bow down and worship me, and I will indwell you. See, if we choose to obey Satan, we're worshiping. If we choose to do those things that are ungodly, we are worshipping the God of this world. And if we are open spiritually as we are when we worship, that's why we receive spirit which is not Holy Spirit. So that when we choose to walk in ungodly ways, we put ourselves in a dangerous place. We become vulnerable to the indwelling spirit, not of the the Lord, but of the enemy. Some of you may be asking the question, well, surely a Christian cannot be possessed by a devil, by a demon, by a spirit. And I would answer that question and say, well, I agree with the people who say that statement in those words. But the word that's translated possessed in our NIV and in the authorized King James Version it's not, it doesn't actually mean being possessed by in terms of owned. The Greek word is dynamitsomai. And it strictly means to have a demon. It doesn't mean that you are owned by the demon. This Bible I bought at a Christian bookshop here in the USA. And I took money out of my pocket. 
I handed it over to the shopkeeper who gave me the Bible back and I then possessed the Bible. I possessed it because I paid the price for it. The only scripture which has any indication of possession and paying a price is in Romans. It talks about you are bought with a price. So, and you're a believer, you are possessed. Now, I praise God that I can look at every one of you who is a believer today here and say, praise God, you're possessed. Amen. You're not possessed by demons. You're possessed by the Lord Jesus Christ who paid the price for you. So you are possessed. But becoming a Christian is a come-as-you-are party. You know what I mean? You come as you are at the invitation. Just as I am, I come. I don't go and get myself cleaned up first because I can't clean myself up first. Only he can do it. We have to come dirty. And then he begins the work of cleaning us up. Now, I live in a very old house. When we bought this house, it's 300 years old. When we bought this house, it was full of woodworm. Now, you have termites and things like here in the States, I know. And they eat away at timber. And when I bought the house, I paid the money to the seller, and I received the deeds for the property, and I then possessed the house. But the house I possessed had woodworm. And I then had to deal with the woodworm. It needed delivering. You're possessed by Jesus because he paid the price for you. But when he got to you and he got the deeds to the property, it may well have had a bit of woodworm that needed deliverance. You see, the dynamitsamai means have a demon. It doesn't mean possessed by one. And so when we become God's possession, Jesus says, I now want to clean you up. I now want to set you free. I now want to release you from the powers of darkness. I now want to fulfill what Isaiah said that Jesus would do. He would set the captives free. And so we may have a bit of woodworm, the demonic that may have invaded us, and we may, as believers, walk in sin from time to time, and we walk in Satan's territory, and we then might need deliverance. We need to be set free. Ephesians chapter 4 is a, a letter that's written to believers, written to Christians. And in Ephesians, the, Paul is warning about all the things that believers can do. He talks about the deceitful desires that they have, ungodly living, about speaking falsehoods, about wrong sexual relationships. And he's saying that believers... If you do these things, you're putting a welcome mat down. And his actual words were, do not give the devil a foothold. Now, the purpose of a foothold is to gain entry. We used to have in the UK a lot of door-to-door -door salesmen. And they were trained to talk about the product on the doorstep and put your foot inside the door. Because if your foot's inside the door, the person who owns the house can't really get rid of you till they have bought something that you're selling. So a foothold is to gain access. And when we willingly walk in Satan's ways, Paul is warning us, there's danger. Don't give a foothold to the enemy. 1 Peter chapter 5 says, the devil's like a roaring lion. He's speaking to believers, seeking whom he may devour. We need to be on our guard. So... Deliverance ministry is a branch of the healing ministry which Jesus brought to set the captives free. And it's part of the whole gospel that is there that's pr to proclaim. And it's a message of hope, a message of liberation, a message which is absolutely critical for us to take on board and to apply in our lives. So... Let's now look at the healing and deliverance ministry of Jesus. 
he began his ministry when he came back from the wilderness. Remember, as we said just now, he went into the wilderness and Luke tells us he was full of the Spirit. And then he, after all these times of temptation, he came back from the wilderness and it says that he came back in the power of the Spirit. There was a difference between going in the fullness of the Spirit and coming back in the power of the Spirit. And what was the difference? It was resisting temptation. When we say no to the devil, it empowers us and gives us greater authority. When we said no to the enemy, we have an earned authority which enables us to actually take up the battle in setting the captives free. And when Jesus came back to Nazareth, he was the preacher for the day. A bit like I'm the preacher for today. Jesus was the preacher for the day in Luke's Gospel, chapter 4. And he quoted from Isaiah 61, which we already referred to. And he said, today, this is fulfilled before your very eyes and in your hearing. The Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. It's happening. Now, you'd imagine that all the people there listening, thinking, this prophecy is going to be fulfilled. We're going to get healed. We're going to get set free. You'd think the people would be really excited about the possibility of what Jesus was talking about. They weren't terribly excited. In fact, they were a bit angry that here was this carpenter's son who was saying these things. Who are you to say these things? And they began to drive him out of the synagogue. They took him outside of the town. They took him to the top of a cliff to try and throw him over the cliff and kill him. Now, that's a bit bit strong, the reaction. And I I hope you haven't got that spirit here today that I'm teaching these things. Uh, I don't know if there's any cliffs around here, but (laughs) they drove Jesus out of the town. They took him to the top of a cliff, trying to throw him over the edge to kill him. Now, what had he done? What was it that was so awful that Jesus had done, which meant that the people had this extreme reaction? I'll tell you what it was. He tried to start a healing ministry in his local church. Listen, Satan hates healing because it sets the captives free. And the people who are healed have a message to tell to the nations. The people that have been delivered know that the enemy has a master, a different one who has greater authority. And Satan filled the people with anger, it says in the scripture. And they tried to drive him out of the town. But all that Jesus had said was, today, this prophecy is being fulfilled. And throughout his ministry, Jesus continued to fulfill that prophecy to set the captives free. The following Saturday, he was in Capernaum. Capernaum's a nearby town in Galilee. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach the people. And the people were amazed at his teaching because his message had authority. That's what it says in verse 32. See, this word authority keeps on coming up. He, he, positionally, he had a higher authority than anyone else. What he said wasn't just words but it came across with authority that people knew that this was true. This was reality. This was something that wasn't just discussed as good ideas, but what was being said with authority was life-changing. So much so that there was a man in the synagogue, and verse 33 actually says he was possessed by a demon. That's a mistranslation. It should have said he had a demon, In the synagogue, there was a man who had a demon, an evil spirit. He cried out at the top of his voice, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. You see, the demons know who Jesus is. 
they know that ultimately their master Satan was thrown out of heaven by Father, Son, Holy Spirit, by God himself, by Jesus knew exactly what happened on that day. And the demons recognize him. And Jesus now starts addressing the demon. Be quiet, he said sternly. It's not a little thought, please will you go home. <sighs> Be quiet. And he ordered the demon to come out of him. And then the demon threw the man down before them all. It wasn't a really quiet little bit of ministry on the side. This was a display of the demonic in this person's life. And the man was thrown down on the ground. The first time that this actually happened to me, you, you remember when you're in ministry, the first time that things happened. You remember those more than any other time. But the first time this actually happened to me was teaching in a, an Anglican church, the Church of England, Episcopal Church. And this was morning service, called it matins. And there was the liturgy, we're going through the, the service order. And then I was the guest speaker, invited to speak, preach on healing. And I was a few minutes into my preaching, and obviously because of the experience that God had given us, of that authority in what you say, and in the middle of the sermon, the woman on this side of the church, she suddenly stood up, she started shouting out at me, she was screaming, and she was saying, shut up, shut up. And she had a Bible in her hand, she was tearing the Bible into pieces and throwing them at me. Now, this was not part of the normal Anglican liturgy for the day. <laughs> it wasn't something I'd experienced before. But looking back at Luke's Gospel, chapter 4, it's much the same sort of thing that was happening there as was happening then. And this lady was really screaming out. And two of our team went to her. By the time they got to her, she was thrown down on the ground. And all I could do was just look at her and take authority and she was thrown down on the ground just the same way that uh, the man in the scripture had and the team just helped her out, almost carried her out into the minister's room which was just over there and they carried on praying with her. Now I carried on preaching and I was conscious that now after this episode that everybody else was hanging on to their seats. I think they were just wondering who's going to be the next and Suddenly, out of this room, there came the most loud, blood-curdling scream you could ever wish to hear. And everybody's heads, they turned looking at the door, wondering what had happened the other side. Now, we know later that she was mightily delivered. And this was a believer, a woman who was a key part of the church. But in that church, there were a lot of people who did not believe that Christians could have demons and thought that I was in total deception and in the afternoon, they had a special meeting in the church to ask me questions. And I was being well grilled by all the people sitting on this side of the church who were sitting there really angry. And all the people on, who wanted to really move on in the spirit and to see healing come to church, they were all over here, all together. So, and all the questions were coming from over here. And I was hearing questions for the first time on some of these things and asking the Lord just for interpretation and his answers as I went, went. And suddenly, I was, I was really quite uncomfortable. This woman at the back of the church who'd been delivered in the morning, she got up out of her seat, and she was, this was North Country England. Now, the, the northerners, they tell it as it is. And she walked forward like this. You know, she, she, when a woman puts her elbows out and walks like that, you know you have problems. Uh, and... She came up to the front, and she didn't ask. She grabbed the microphone from me, and she put one hand on her hip. She put her foot out, and she said, now you lot, listen. She said, I'm your church secretary. I was born again five years ago, and I didn't think I had a demon, but I did, and now I don't, so there. <laughs> and... She gave me the microphone back and walked back to her seat. We have no more questions. But that evening, we had a healing service in the church. And this lady and her husband 
and her daughter were there. Now, in the morning, she had been delivered of a powerful generational spirit of witchcraft, knowing that in the generation line there had been witchcraft that had, and that hadn't been discerned before, and she was completely set free. And in the evening, she brought her daughter for healing. Now, generational spirits, they tend to come down the generation lines. Exodus 25 talks about the visitation on one generation and the other. And this daughter, when she was born, she was born with infantile asthma. Her breathing was, she was touch and go whether she would survive at birth. And all through the years, up to the age of 12, where she was at this meeting, she was chronically asthmatic, constantly having to have a spray available to be able to suck in and to deal with the symptoms. And they brought her forward for healing. Now, her mother had been set free in the morning. And we prayed for her healing in the evening. And her daughter was delivered of a spirit of infirmity that was upon her chest. And she was totally and radically healed of the asthma. And I'm not just saying that as that, well, that happened, we didn't have any follow-up. Ten years later, I met the parents at the conference, and they said, do you remember? I said, I will never forget. And she said, our daughter never had another asthma attack. She said, I and my husband after that decided that we had to give our lives to the Lord in ministry, and for the last ten years we've been in full-time Christian work. See, they'd seen the evidence that Jesus sets the captives free. And sometimes when these things happen, you may think, oh, what a mess. And it was a bit messy at Capernaum. This man was thrown down. He was screaming out. And sometimes it can be a bit messy, especially when you're dealing in that sort of situation. But when we come in full repentance and deal with all the issues in our lives, then the deliverance is much easier. Because the ground has been taken from the enemy. The, the way to deal with deliverance much more easily is to remove the ground on which the enemy is standing. And when he's got nothing left to stand on, he's lost all his power. And the authority just tells him to go. So this was an event in Capernaum which really stunned the people. And you know what they said? We're amazed. Verse 36. All the people were amazed, and they said to each other, what's this teaching? Now, here's these words again. With authority and power. He gives orders to evil spirits, and they come out. He had the power, and he also had the authority. And the news about him spread throughout the surrounding area. What John the Baptist said, when these things happen, everyone's going to take notice. The news is spread throughout the surrounding area. There were many deliverances that Jesus did. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 9, verses 37 to 43, you have the account of an epileptic boy. The next day, when they came down from the mountain, a large crowd met, this was coming from the Mount of Transfiguration, and a man in the crowd called out, Teacher, I beg you, look at my son. He's my only child. A spirit seizes him, and he suddenly screams, it throws him into convulsions so that he foams at the mouth. It scarcely, scarcely ever leaves him. It's destroying him. I begged your disciples to drive it out, but they couldn't. And Jesus did, speaks to the disciples, said, you unbelieving and perverse generation. How long do I have to put up with you? Then he says to the man, bring your son here. And it was a, a vital lesson. This was a lesson to the disciples about dealing with this particular form of spirit. And whilst the boy was coming towards Jesus, the demon threw him to the ground in a convulsion. He had an epileptic fit. So as the boy was coming towards Jesus, who had the authority, the spirit inside manifest. And sometimes you find that the spirit manifests when it's in a place where the authority of Jesus is also manifest. And... Jesus delivered the boy of the evil spirit. He rebuked the evil spirit and healed the boy and gave him back to his father. 
And sometimes you find in a number of these stories in the scriptures, the spirit is cast out and then there was a healing to take place. Because where the spirit has been, it's left a mess. And you can't just say, oh, I'm going to be involved in deliverance. You can't just say, well, yes, I've got a call into deliverance ministry. Actually, we've got a call into the healing ministry. And sometimes we need to minister deliverance. At other times, we need to minister inner healing, dealing with forgiveness issues, dealing with emotion, dealing with rejection. At other times, you then to minister deliverance. But in healing, you're moving from one to the other. You're dealing with the inner healing one moment, then deliverance, and then praying for physical healing. We need to be aware of all the different aspects of healing so that you can minister to them comprehensively when you're praying with somebody. So here's this epileptic boy. Forgive me, I'll just take a sip of water. I'm not sure why that gets an applause, but I'll have another one. The, the first time that we did a conference in Scotland, it was a, a, church, of, a, a church of Scotland's uh, fellowship that they wanted to find out about the healing ministry. And on the Saturday morning, we were teaching at the conference and just before lunch, I was about to close the meeting, a boy who was sitting in the meeting, he was about 16 years of age, and he got up and he went out. I had no idea why he got up and gone out until we broke for lunch. The pastor came to see me and said, Peter, would you come quickly? I want you to pray for James. He's unconscious on the church steps. He's had an epileptic fit. Tell me about James. He said, well, James has been epileptic since he was a young boy. So in that case, it's not something which is a result of an accident or a head injury or anything like that. This is something, again, that's been generational. So I found James, they're unconscious. Now, when somebody's unconscious, you can still talk to their spirit. The spirit never goes unconscious. When you're in hospital praying with someone in a coma, remember every word you say can be heard by the Spirit. And you can lead someone to even to, in repentance in the Spirit. And so there's James lying unconscious. His soul and his body is unconscious, but spiritually, he's still alive. And I spoke to James and I said, James, I just want to lead you in a prayer. And I'm going to give it you phrase by phrase to pray and I'm going to leave space for you in the spirit to agree with me in that prayer and the prayer was very simple Lord Jesus I forgive every one of my ancestors for everything that they have done which has resulted in me being an epileptic very simple prayer I gave it to him phrase by phrase left a space for him to pray it in the spirit. I had no idea whether he was hearing or not in the flesh, but I knew in the spirit he could hear. And then came to the end of the prayer and then took authority over every spirit of infirmity that had caused this epilepsy. Absolutely nothing was happening. This was totally in faith. You're seeing nothing happening because he's unconscious. But suddenly after I'd taken authority over the spirit and I'd laid my hands on him for healing, his eyes opened, he sat up, and he stood up. And his first words, and I'll never forget them, first words, I'm healed. I said, how do you know? He said, normally when I've had an epileptic fit and in the church they knew James and he had many epileptic fits. He said, normally, he said, I have flashing lights, I have intense headaches, I have to lie down for 24 hours, but I feel fine. I have no symptoms whatsoever. <laughs> and James went back to Aberdeen Hospital about six weeks later, where he had a regular appointment with the clinic in the hospital. And they reran all the tests, because he's had no epileptic fit since that moment and his appointment. They re-ran all the tests. And not only did they say that there's 
no sign of epilepsy. They said, there's no evidence that we can see that you've ever been an epileptic. And, and, and the doctors had a problem. Because here's these 16 years of medical notes of all his examinations and tests and all the medication that he'd been receiving. And they wrote across the medical notes, this is a case of misdiagnosis. That was the only way that the medics could reconcile it. Now, that was God's mercy, because in England, if you are an epileptic, you cannot get a driving license. But if he's never been an epileptic, according to the medics, there is no problem. <laughs> and James passed his driving test the following year. And, <laughs> and again, we've recently been in touch with the family and got his degree... Many things have happened since then, and no further consequences. See, not only does Jesus set the captives free, he has given authority to believers to follow in his footsteps. Luke 9, verses 1 and 2, when Jesus had called the 12 together, he gave them, oh, these words again, <laughs> power and authority. He gave them power through the relationship he had with them, the delegated authority, which I talked about yesterday. What was it for? To drive out demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. See, the proclamation of a kingdom is a proclamation of kingly authority. And he sent them out and gave them that authority and sent them out to heal the sick and to cast out demons. And they came back. Rejoicing. You see, this is a delegated authority. And at the end of Matthew's gospel, when Jesus gave the Great Commission, he says, go into all the world and make disciples. You know that here. And he says, go and teach them, teach their new disciples to do all the things that I taught you to do. Teach them to obey the things that I taught you to do. And so in ministering the gospel... People become believers, and a believer is not made by man. It's the Holy Spirit redeeming the soul out of the hands of the enemy, and the Holy Spirit giving new life and new birth. That's the work of God, but it's the work of the church to make disciples. It's the work of God to transform the life so that a believer is born again, but it's the work of the church to make disciples, to teach them to obey, to teach them to do the things that Jesus asked them to do. I see, if we make believers, we see people born again in the Spirit of God, but we don't make them into disciples, and we haven't taught them to obey, they're then very vulnerable to doing all sorts of things. And it's amazing how often new believers who are not discipled a year later are nowhere near the church. Because the enemy has come in and led them astray. And the birds of the air have come and pecked the seed. And they finish up further away than perhaps they were before. See, discipling is absolutely critical. And in the process of discipling, healing is part of it. You cannot separate healing from discipleship. And if you try and make disciples without healing, you set people up in such a way that it's all in the head and it's not in the heart. And we need to be whole. And we say to our team, don't ever get interested in, in healing ministry unless you're willing to be healed yourself. Don't pray for other people unless you're willing to allow the Holy Spirit to expose things in yourself that need healing. We don't have to be perfect before God starts using us, but we have to be willing for him to change us. And one step at a time, in our willingness for him to change us, then he will do. And he will show us things, day by day, that we can deal with, things that we have to turn from, things that we have to be released into as we seek to serve him. One more story, Luke's Gospel, chapter 13. I wish I had time to go through that all the healing and inner healing and physical healing ministry of Jesus, but I don't. Luke's Gospel, chapter 13, verses 10 
to 17. One of my favorite stories. I've got a lot of favorite stories. A crippled woman healed on the Sabbath. A woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. And when Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you're set free from your infirmity. And then he put his hands on her, and immediately she straightened up and praised God. There's a two-stage ministry here. The first thing Jesus sees is that the physical condition has been caused by the work of a spirit over a long period of time. And this particular story introduces something very significant. If she's had the spirit for 18 years, it means that 19 years ago she didn't. It means that there was a moment in her life when that spirit gained access. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us what it was, and I'm quite glad it doesn't. Because if it told us what it was, people would think that was the only way you could get a demon. But there are many different ways. She might have been sexually abused. She might have had a trauma, had an accident. There might have been something that's come down the generation line. Who knows? But all that the gospel tells us, that she'd been like this for 18 years. And when the spirit came in, she was probably able to stand up straight. But over the years, she became more and more crippled and unable to move properly. And when Jesus saw her, he saw the spirit, and he dealt with the spirit. But having dealt with the spirit, she needed healing. So he now laid his hands on her for the healing of her body. This is a two-stage healing process. No, the spirit's no longer there. Therefore, there's no longer an obstacle to the healing. When I talk about this story, I'm always reminded of a lady called, a young lady called Karen. And she was 18 years of age. This woman had been for 18 years affected by the spirit. And Karen came for a healing service at L.L. Grange, our centre in England. And she stood in the aisle and I said to her, Karen, what have you come for? And she said, I've got a viral condition on both my kidneys. The doctors have said I've got less than 12 months to live. She said, I'm dying. Now, as a minister, someone's standing there only 18. And they've received what seems like a death sentence. You're full with compassion. I had one of our young people alongside me, and we train, we train our young people to come alongside us in ministry, and the young lady that was one of our ministry team called Katrina was there alongside, and she was quite shocked to realize that someone her age had received a death sentence in the medical prognosis. And I'm listening to Karen, but I'm also trying to listen to God at the same time. It's that sort of two-way conversations. And, Lord, what do I pray? And I sense the Lord saying to me, ask her about her mother. And I'm saying, God, it's her kidney. It's not her mother that's the problem. <laughs> and you have this little argument with God sometimes when he says something. But the, I've learned over the years, it's better to be obedient to God than to argue with him. And I said, Karen, tell me about your mother. And she said, oh, I, I have no idea who my mother is. She said, my mother fell pregnant at age 16. I was given away for adoption. I have no idea who my mother is or my father. And immediately I had revelation. And I said to Karen, that means that you are a product of sexual sin. And she laughed. She said, well, I've never thought about it that way before, but yes. I said, are you willing to forgive your parents for their sexual sin in conceiving you? She said, yeah, yes. And I said, are you willing to thank God that they didn't abort you? Yes. And she prayed that prayer of forgiveness and thanking God for her life. And I then said, put your hand over your tummy where you were joined to your mum. And I took some oil and blessed the oil, asked God to fill that oil with his spirit just by laying hands on the oil. And I made the sign of the cross there. 
And I said, in the name of Jesus, I take authority over every spirit of infirmity that came into you down your generation line, was given access through the sexual sin of your parents. And I order it to leave. And immediately she began to feel something turning in her stomach. It went round and round and round as if like a snake unwinding. That was her words. It came up into her chest and said, oh, and then she wrecks this thing out. And she was standing there and I said, I said, how do you feel? She said, I feel light in my tummy. And I couldn't really quite understand what light in your tummy actually meant, but it, it sounded good. And <laughs> now, Katrina, next door, uh, watching this, uh, I said to Katrina, now, I'd like you to lay hands on her kidneys. See, her kidneys were very swollen. And a bit like the woman in the scripture, she'd been delivered, but she hadn't been healed. And I said to Katrina, now you stand there and lay your hands on the kidneys and pray for healing. And Katrina said, well, I've never prayed for anyone for healing before. What do I pray? I said, do you pray in tongues? She said, yes. I said, well, you just pray in tongues and trust God. And she stood there for 20 minutes. I went off and prayed with somebody else in this healing service. And when I came back, Katrina still had her hands glued to Karen's kidneys. But the kidney swelling had gone. And all the pain had gone. And beforehand, Karen, she couldn't bend over because of the pain. And she bent over and she touched her toes. And she's another one who went back to the hospital. And she had all the tests rerun on her kidneys. And the doctor said, we can't find any evidence of the virus that was there before. And we advise you just to go and forget what we said last time and go and live a normal life. See, this was... The mercy of God, setting the captives free, bringing hope, bringing healing, bringing restoration. Jesus doing today the same things that he did 2,000 years ago. Jesus is still setting the captives free. Whether it's the woman in the church or the epileptic boy or the woman with the spirit of infirmity or many, many others. These are not just stories you make up to impress an audience. This is the pilgrimage of faith, of seeing the reality of Jesus setting the captives free just this last weekend in the conference Beauty for Ashes that we've just done in Florida. There was a woman there who, at the age of six, was severely sexually abused by her uncle and other members of the family. And that inner core of her being, where the enemy had come in, in that situation, she was completely locked away. I haven't got time, it's 11.58, to tell you the rest of the story, but I can tell you the conclusion. At the end of that time of prayer, she was absolutely rejoicing because Jesus had set her inner being free from the control of the enemy. Yes, in that case, there was a loud scream but it was a scream in the end which turned to the laughter and joy which comes from within. And Nehemiah said those words, the joy of the Lord shall be your strength. And I want to tell you that the joy of seeing people set free from the control of the enemy is something which is beyond anything that the world can offer. To see the supernatural power of the living God ministered in the authority of the name of Jesus and bringing restoration to broken lives. There's nothing like it. We see people born again in the Spirit of God. We've done over 3,500 healing retreats now over the years. On virtually every single one of those retreats, people have come in need of healing. But the first thing we introduce them to is the Savior. And then they come to a place being born again, and they know the Lord, and the power of the Holy Spirit is upon them. And they're filled with the Spirit and delivered and healed, life transformed. This is the joy of the Lord. And I want to encourage you as followers of the Lord Jesus to minister evangelism, but never to forget that those who are saved, they need delivering, they need healing, they need setting free, they need discipling so that they will become strong. And Isaiah 61 says that those who were the ones who were broken, they are the ones that shall become the oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord, 
And my desire, our passion as a ministry is that the hurting and the broken shall become the oaks of righteousness. The ones who have been strengthened and restored, who have a story to tell to the nations and that they will go and tell it. Father, I pray today for each and every one of the students here that your Holy Spirit will continue to touch them and challenge them for their own lives and for the ministries that you are calling them into. Help them, Lord, as people to never forget that you have redeemed them out of the hand of the enemy. He doesn't possess them, but they may need a bit of cleaning up. Lord, help us to be willing to walk in your ways, to be set free to serve you and to fulfill our destiny. In Jesus' name, amen. of repentance and they talked about the fact that the kingdom of heaven is coming and saying repent and that means turn round change direction and it's not just repent in the head it means repent with the heart and it's so easy to say oh yes I repent but in your heart you're still thinking I'll do it again we need to be in a place where repentance is not just a head issue it's a heart issue also Then there was a little problem took place by the River Jordan. Jesus was in the line waiting to be baptized. Now this gave John the Baptist a real problem because Jesus was without sin. And John the Baptist had already said, look, he's the Lamb of God who will take away the sin of the world. And that's a messianic statement. He is the perfect Lamb. You couldn't get rid of any old scraggy old lamb in the sacrificial system. It had to be a perfect lamb. And Jesus was the perfect lamb of God, without sin. And here he is, in the line, waiting to be baptized. And John says, I can't baptize you. You baptize me. And the two of them have a bit of an argument on the banks of the River Jordan as to who's going to do it. And Jesus then said, it's necessary to fulfill my Father's will. And Jesus submitted to a baptism of repentance. Now, he's never sinned. So why is he repenting? But on the cross, he was going to die for your sins and mine. So he came in an association with your sin and mine in an act, going into that baptism of repentance, and he was pleasing the Father. And at that moment, Jesus entered into the commission that his Father had given him. And the moment he associated himself with your sin and with mine, the heavens opened. And the Spirit of God came down. And that when God put man on the earth, he gave power through relationship and he gave authority over the earth. Now Satan had power but no authority. And what happened in the fall was that man chose to obey Satan. And in choosing to obey Satan, he put his authority that he had over the earth under Satan's control. So Satan got authority back, and he became the god of this world. And we saw how power and authority are very important principles for us to understand. And we'll see a bit more of that in the ministry of Jesus. We saw how the healing message goes through from Genesis 3.15, when God said, One day out of the woman will come one who will crush the head of the serpent. And that means have a higher authority than Satan will be able to deal with him. And so when Jesus came, deliverance ministry was part of his mandate because he had authority to deal with the powers of darkness. We understood that Jesus was without sin and therefore if Satan's here, Jesus is here. Man who has sinned is here, but Jesus came And he never sinned, so he had authority over the powers of darkness. And we who are sinners, who believe in Jesus, are in Christ. So we come into that position of authority with him to be able to deal with the works of darkness in deliverance ministry. We are in Christ, and Christ is in us. You've got that twofold, that we're in him, and he is in us. And then we came right to the end of our teaching yesterday and we saw how John the Baptist brought a message saying, prepare the way of the Lord, 
make the way straight for him. And he and his disciples were preaching a doctrine, teaching, and everybody saw the reality that this is my beloved son, as the father was saying. They saw the dove descending. This was the moment at which Jesus began to fulfill his ministry commission. You know, sometimes people ask me, well, how can I get more anointed? How can I get more of the Holy Spirit? And my answer is always, get more obedient to what God has asked you to do. Because at that moment, the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus in that act of supreme obedience. And at that moment, Jesus' ministry began. And how did it begin? He was driven into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Oh, Lord, no, not that. You might think that when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, it's the glory train from then on. You know, but at that moment, God wants you to be tested. He wants to know that you're going to follow him and obey him. And he allows the enemy to test us. And there are three major temptations that Jesus received. I'm not going to go into them all because of time. But one of them I want to just draw attention to. Because it's highly relevant to this subject of deliverance. The devil led Jesus to a high place. And showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to Jesus... I will give you all their authority. Oh, that word again. Satan saying to Jesus, I will give you all their authority and splendor for it's been given to me. Now, who gave it to Satan? Mankind did. Man gave that authority to Satan. And Satan said, yes, it's been given to me. So if it's been given to me, I can give it away. And so Jesus, forget about the cross Forget about all the things that you thought were a good idea to do to redeem mankind. I can give you an easier way. So uh, we want to give a loud shout for him as he comes up and, and get, has another word for us. So, good morning, everybody. It's good to be back with you. I'm glad you've come back for a second time. And uh, today we're going to be pursuing the subjects that we're looking at yesterday, but looking at in a bit more detail. One thing I omitted yesterday was to actually tell you who Satan was. Uh, you remember he was on the platform, at least Matt Moore was on the platform, uh, taking the part of Satan, a little drama. Matt, will you just stand up a second? Matt is the USA... <laughs> National Director for LL Ministries, and some of you may get to know him a bit more if you ever come to the LL Center in Florida. Anyway, Matt is the director there. Outside, we have a number of books that have come through the work of LL Ministries, and we're doing a couple of special offers for you for today, 
Uh, the book that's used here and has been used for teaching, which I wrote a number of years ago, called Hearing Through Deliverance, it's a great big tome, uh, but it's got an awful lot in it, and its normal price is $35, but for the students here at this, if you buy them here, it's $25, so uh, that's available today outside at $25. And a book which I'll be talking a bit about tomorrow on healing from accident, shock, and trauma. That's only just come out, and that's 17, but it's 12 for you here. And 10% off all the other books. There's quite a lot of resources. Uh, we, we want you to be able to buy them as cheaply as possible. Yesterday, we did some foundational work in putting in place some theological understanding of the healing and deliverance ministry. We understand in Alhu Drama that when Satan was thrown out of heaven, he lost his authority, but he still had power. We saw that when God created mankind, he made us in God's image and likeness. We are three in one, just as God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We are spirit, we are soul, and we are body.